All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here on a snowy day. Uh, I know that maybe you had to brave some slippery roads to get here, but I appreciate you doing that, and uh, hopefully it'll be worth your time. We're going to be talking about gradients today, which is one of the trickier concepts uh, this semester for, pe for people to first pick up on. I'll try and warn you when we're uh, approaching a particular subject that throws people off, and today's one of them, so it's good you didn't skip. Uh, a bit of announcement before we start talking about gradients. Uh, homework 4, that's due on Wednesday the 6th. So uh, please remember that all the submissions to MU Online need to be, for, uh, be before class starts on that date. All right, so interest factors. This is an extension of some of the ideas we've already addressed so far. Um, let's begin by reviewing the standard notation for converting between present values and annual series. Remember, an annual series is where each one of these amounts is the same amount and it's consecutive without any gaps in timing. Those are the two characteristics of an annual series, which is also known as a uniform series. I guess uniform series is probably a better name for it because remember, a period doesn't have to be a year. A period could be a month, a quarter, a period could be a week. It's just how frequently we're considering the compounding of the interest uh, is sometimes how we choose what duration to use as a period. So this is the typical cash flow diagram where you have an unknown P that you would deposit to receive a uh, known given uh, uniform series. Remember that the factor for that summary, the, the way that we'd summarize a problem like that is that it's find P given A for some interest rate I and N number of years. And N is the number of years uh, that the cash flow diagram goes through where there's one, two, three, four, five payments in this case. There isn't a payment at zero. So an annual series only includes these amounts being at times other than the present. So what if you also had some amount at the present? So if there was also an amount at time zero, then that would have to be accounted for separately. And there are cases where you'll have both an annual series and a, an existing present amount in the same cash flow diagram. So we'll have like overlaying series together. Uh, so if we look at it the other way and the present value is known, and we're solving for an annual amount, then we would change the uh, what's inside that factor in the parentheses there. That's A slash P because we have the unknown first. Find A given P. Or that ratio enables us to multiply whatever the factor is by P to get A. And again, there is uh, no amount at time zero that's a part of the annual series. The only thing that we have at the present is our known present amount that we're trying to, after we convert, there will be nothing left at P because we will have spread out the value of that present amount over the annual series after we do the conversion. Okay, so any questions about uniform series? The illustration we're going to do uses the 10% factor table. This is what the factor tables look like in the FE reference manual that's provided. When you take the FE exam, there's a PDF file you can download from NCEES. And it's a couple hundred pages long, just full of engineering formulas and tables. And so the uh, time value of money tables are in there. This is how they've got it formatted, so the 10% table. So let's take a look at this illustration. Um, a chemical engineer believes that by modifying the structure of a certain water treatment polymer, his company would earn an extra $5,000 per year. Now sometimes the hard part is just translating text into a cash flow diagram. So you need the practice of uh, making the most reasonable interpretation of the text. I mean, because it's always possible to misinterpret the text and uh, to find some way that it could be construed in a bizarre way, but you need to think, well, what's the most reasonable thing that could be interpreted from what it's saying here? So 
earn an extra $5,000 per year, interest rate of 10% per year, how much could the company afford to spend now to just break even over a five-year project period? And so the given is an annual amount of 5,000. The unknown is the present equivalent of that. And when they ask how much could the company afford to spend, what they're saying is, if you make a deposit now or an investment, like you're purchasing equipment, somehow doing an improvement, how much would that be so that then you get these cash flow, positive cash flows in the future? Okay, so this is find P given A. Now, let's go to the table that was on the previous slide, the 10% table, five year. So here's 10%, N equals five, and then the column we want is find P given A. So 3.7908. And it's just coincidental that that's in bold. They bold, I think, every five to make it easier to read. Okay, so the factor was 3.7908. If we go to the solution here, 5,000, which is the known annual amount, and we need to discount each one of these when we're moving it to year zero. So that's discounting is the verb. So this 5,000 in year one, when we move it to year zero, it's not worth as much as 5,000. This 5,000 in year five is worth a lot less than the 5,000 in year one was. And so now think about it logically. This ratio, 3.79 for n equals five years, if the discount rate was zero, then that factor would be five. But it's 10%, and so it's going to be less than five. It couldn't be more than five. Otherwise, that would mean that actually the present value is greater than the future value. And we know that that's not the case, that, that those amounts, when we move it back to the present, would be reduced. OK, so uh, if we solve for that, it's going to be 18,954. So it's answer D. So any questions about that so far, that illustration? The other thing I wanted to point out is how powerful it can be if you're compounding. Let's go back to this table. Wouldn't it be nice if you could make a deposit into an account and 10%? Uh, that would be a pretty sweet interest rate to get. You're not likely to find 10% in a bank, but there are some stock investments that over the long term can average 10%. If you put $1 into a 10% return, after 20 years, that $1 is worth 6.72. But compound interest is a crazy thing. The growth is nonlinear. After 100 years, that $1 would be worth 13,780. So if you put some money in the bank, maybe your grandchildren would really thank you for it. Just put it in the bank and kind of forget about it for 100 years. It's really going to grow a lot. So this ratio of F to P kind of gives you a sense that it's accelerating. At first, it's you know small. But if we were going to graph this ratio as a function of time on the x-axis, you'd notice that it kind of gets bigger exponentially after a lot of years. Just something I wanted to throw in there. All right, now what about the uh, standard notation for future? with annual series. Remember, the odd thing about a future value is it occurs in the same year as the last annual payment. We've talked about this before. So again, the annual series, they're consecutive. All of these amounts are the same in an annual series. But when we're solving for F, the trick there is that the last, ca the last cash flow is in the same period. So you wouldn't move it to year six. It would still be in year five. So if you're solving for F, then it's F slash A. If you're solving for A with a given future value, then that's A slash F. OK, our next illustration comes from the 10%, I'm sorry, the 8% table. OK, so read this. So is this uh, find P, find A, find F? 
just maybe off in the margins, why don't you label the variables, F, P, A, I, and N. So if, if the company is saving $10,000 per year, that's counted as a revenue. So the, for a cash flow diagram, those arrows are going to be up because that's money they usually spend that they don't have to spend anymore. And we've already, earlier in the semester, talked about how that's considered a cash flow, an inflow to you if previous expenditures don't have to be spent anymore. So there are seven years of savings, and it says here, how much will the savings amount to in seven years? If you were intentionally trying to uh, misread what it's asking, you'd say, well, it's 7 times 10, you know, 7 times 10,000. But since you know about the cash, uh, the effects of the time value of money, it couldn't be that simple. You know, if they're asking for you to kind of add things up, it's going to have to take into account the interest rate of 8%. So here it's asking you to find the future equivalent of all of these annual savings. So this is find F given A, and we could go back to that table, find F given A. So here's F of A. What was the N when you wrote it there on your page? N equals 7, so we go to the 7 row, 8.9222. Okay, so 8.9228 times the given 10,000, that's the equivalent future value is 89,228. So why is that more than 70,000? Compound interest. When you're moving money forward in time, the amounts increase. So in the previous example, we were moving it back in time, and so that's discounting, and the amounts get smaller. Here, it makes sense to us that the factor should be greater than 7, because there's 7 payments, but they're moving forward in time. All right. Now, gradients is where it sometimes gets confusing. And the reason why is uh, because in a gradient, what we're saying is, what if the amount keeps increasing each year? A uniform gradient or an arithmetic gradient where the amount keeps increasing uh, each year. What's odd about the way gradients are structured is that uh, in year one, it's zero G, which means that there's no amount. Then in year two is G, year three is two G, three G, and so on. And so what throws people off is that if you were kind of move this uh, to the present, it doesn't go to year one. Like if you're discounting this gradient back in time, it doesn't go to one, it would go to zero. And so there's kind of a, a gap year there that people can sometimes forget about the gap year. Uh, G starts at the end of year two, not at the end of year one, where you start to see the gradient because uh, year one is zero times the gradient. That's just you know, the convention that's been agreed on for how to handle gradients like this. And so if we we're going to write it in our new language of summarizing within the brackets there, we'd say this cash flow diagram is find P given G for an interest rate I and a value N. And we can go back to these tables, and you can see that there are tables for P to G, A to G, this particular table looks like it doesn't have an F to G, but such a thing can be determined. Okay, so gradients, uh, we're going to get some exposure with that today. But um, I wanted to, maybe it's been a while since you considered linear interpolation. I know that uh, you are supposed to be taught this in 111, Engineering 111. Do you remember doing some linear interpolation in there? Um, Linear interpolation can be used to calculate factors. Um, let's say, for instance, that if you have the factor, uh, some interest factor at 8% and an interest factor at 9%, you can get that from the table. But there isn't going to be a table for an interest factor at 8.3%. 
And so you could use this idea to linearly interpolate and find out what is the, uh, the factor you need at interest rates that you, do not ha you don't have a table for. Of course, you can always use the, the equations if they're available, but if you're just going with the factors, then the factors can be interpolated. And you'll do that in our in-class exercise today. For instance, if we know that this particular line is defined by a known point at x equals 5 and a known point at x equals, equals 7, and so the y value is 12 and 18 respectively, then let's say we want to know what is, for x equals 6, what's going to be the equivalent y value of that. So this just illustrates the substitutions that you'd make. So you'd start off with the y naught value, the, the initial uh, y value over here on the vertical axis is 12, and then we find the difference in the y values, the difference in the uh, how far away we are from the initial x value. Um, you can kind of derive this yourself by finding the slope of the line, but if you just want to strictly stick, stick with the substitutions, uh, I'll leave this on the screen when we work through the in-class exercise problem number one. Um, all right, so gradients are a little bit tricky, and the, uh, the first problem on the back side of the paper, uh, I ask questions in a sequence to try and illustrate to you what is the standard way of seeing and expressing a gradient. Uh, I ask the questions in a certain order kind of to draw your attention to that gap year, for example, to the fact that the amounts are increasing by a steady value and so on. So I will hand that out. We got a two-page in-class exercise today. Are you wearing shorts? Oh, I thought you were wearing... It looks like you are. It's going to scold you for not being reasonable. Let me bring the solution to the first problem up on the screen. Did everybody get uh, 22 point, uh, 2.22145? All right, good. So if you need to uh, glance at that later, of course, it's on the video. Got some good questions about the gradient. How many years is it, you know? Because you're only seeing the arrows during, uh, there's only three arrows on there, but something's happening in year one, that's the year of zero G. So it does count. So N equals four for that gradient.
You're in 111 the same semester as this? Oh, really? Hmm. We need to make a prerequisite so that can't be the case. All right, I got some good questions on uh, problem two about how I had said IE in year zero. What that meant was find the present value, meaning the value in year zero. So take it all to year zero. That didn't mean uh, go to the table and look for the row where n equals zero, because we already know n equals four from the previous question. So uh, the table method, I said $930.02, but Look, as far as precision goes, we've only got five digits in that factor, so it's not actually accurate to the nearest penny. We're not accustomed to rounding off money to the nearest tenth of a dollar, uh, which is why I went ahead and I expressed it to the nearest penny. But the reality is if we solved this by the equation method, it might not be two cents. It, it's maybe something else other than two cents. But it would be certainly accurate to the nearest dollar. And then you'll notice my solution for part D. I go ahead and I take the time to calculate these intermediate quantities. I'll really uh, encourage that as a worthy investment of your time because it pays in an exam. You don't want to lose any points. Double check your calculations. And if you can kind of give yourself these uh, intermediate calculations as a signpost and double checking to make sure, like when you crunch the numbers a second time, do you get that same? 56.32 is the first factor, 50 is the second factor. It's just kind of, you can see on the page what's happening and why if you write these intermediate steps. Anybody want to ask questions on problem two? Let me show you what the cash flow diagram should look like if you break it up into the two parts. Because this cash flow diagram has an annual series and a gradient smushed together. So when you separate them, then the cash flow diagram is going to look like this. We've got a gradient and we've got an annual series and we can treat them like two different problems and then sum the answers in the end. So that's how we... Uh, can break it apart. So the annual series has A equals 400. The gradient, there's G equals 30. So if it's two different cash flow diagrams and we want to take, the, take them both to P, we can just get the equations off of that paper I gave you last time. P to A equation, the P to G equation. The P to G equation, that's a beauty. Lots of opportunities for mistakes on that one. you because this is the first time you're seeing a gradient. It probably seems really bizarre, but after you've seen two or three gradients, um, it's impossible to not just automatically know, all right, there's the gap here. Um, we're going to do some more practice with this, so you'll definitely have the exposure you need before you get a quiz or an exam. But if you have any questions, please let me know. Let's take one last look at these announcements before... You begin your weekend. Homework four is due on Wednesday.
I know some of you are already practically finished with that assignment. I applaud you for getting the early start. If you want to work on it over the weekend and have any questions, please uh, let me know if you've got stuck on anything, and I'll try and respond via email. Other than that, I'll see you on Monday.